Okay. Well, howdy. And good morning. And welcome to the uh, GIAC meeting. I'm Karen Butler Purdy from Texas A&M University. And um, we, I guess we are happy to welcome several new members. We will start by uh, going around and introducing ourselves. So maybe we can start to the far left. Good morning. I'm Kara McCaleb, and I'm the interim dean for the College of Graduate Studies at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. Good morning. I'm Blanca Bauer. I'm the assistant VP for academic assessment and effectiveness at UT Health San Antonio. I'm Richard Berry, professor of music at Stephen F. Austin State University. Good morning, um, John Saigon, um, University of Texas San Antonio Interim Dean for Graduate School, also Senior Vice Provost for Strategic Initiatives and uh, Institutional Effectiveness. Good morning and welcome. I'm Jennifer Nalos. I'm a Program Director here at the Coordinating Board. Andrea Guilado, um, Dean of the Graduate College at Texas State University and Vice Chair of this committee. Good morning, everyone. I'm James Gilman, and I'm the other CB staff liaison to this committee. Good morning. I'm Bill Harn. I'm Dean of Graduate Studies at Lamar University. Hello. I'm Ken Hendrickson. I'm Dean of the Graduate School at Sam Houston State. Joseph Opong, Associate Dean in the Graduate School in North Texas. Good morning. My name is Tom Krieger. I'm Professor of Finance and Chair of the Accounting and Finance Department, Texas A&M, Kingsville. Good morning. I'm Raymond Jackson. I'm the Associate Dean of Graduate Studies at the University of Texas at Arlington. Good morning. I'm Barry Lambert, Dean of the College of Graduate Studies at Tarleton State University. Good morning. I'm Sarah Larson. I'm the Vice Provost and Dean of the Graduate School at the University of Houston. Good morning. Kathy Matthew, Associate Vice President in Academic Affairs, University of Houston, Clear Lake. Dean Nykirk, Associate Dean in the Graduate School, University of Texas at Austin. Good morning, Rajkumar Lakshmanaswamy, Inshad Raj from Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in El Paso. Cynthia Rutledge, Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs, Curriculum and Instruction and Faculty Development at McMurray University. Jennifer Schrader, Associate Dean of the Graduate School at Texas A&M Commerce. Uh, Mark Sheridan, Vice Provost and Dean of the Graduate School at Texas Tech University. Sarah Lynn McKinnon Crowley, Student Representative. I'm a graduate student at the University of Texas at Austin. Andrew Zinn, I'm Dean of the Graduate School at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Good morning, everyone. I'm Stacy Silverman, Deputy Assistant Commissioner in the Division of Academic Quality and Workforce here at the Coordinating Board, and welcome. We're so glad that you're here today. Thank you. I think we have one more person. Hello, I'm Devanna Fulton, Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Houston downtown. Okay, well, thank you all. So I think the next item on our agenda is to just go over a few things related to the meeting proceedings. Uh, well, we don't have anyone on the phone, so I won't go over that. But um, in terms of uh, speaking, so uh, press your microphone button when you want to speak, and then if you can turn it off when you finish. Um, also, I think uh, we're collecting lunch money for those of you who have not uh, turned in your envelope if you ordered lunch today. Uh, in terms of action items, so if there are action items, then um, they require a motion and then a second and a vote. And discussion items don't require an action. And then lastly, I guess that uh, surveys will be sent out following the meeting to uh, ascertain travel and cost information. I don't know if you guys want to talk a little more about that. Um, so usually after each GIAC meeting, we'll send out some summary notes um, and possible action items. And one of those is um, getting an estimate or as accurate as possible um, of your expenditures and costs related to participating. This is compiled um, and 
put into our annual reporting, which uh, Dr. Glotto will talk about a little bit later, um, but it gives us a good idea of what um, the costs in time and um, university and campus resources are for your participation um, as a member of this committee. And so we'll receive a link to fill, fill that out um, following the meeting. Yeah, just just so you know, this 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 isn't particular to you. This is a, a standard part of the government code, and we do this for all of our external advisory committees. Okay. Anything else you guys want to mention, James? Nope. Okay. So you will notice that today's agenda is really full of discussion items, and um, so um, we will kind of try to time it so that we can go through the different items we may end up deciding to uh, table some items if you know the discussion is is really uh, rich and so we'll sort of see how we go I think it's been a while since we had a long such a long list of discussion items so I, actually I think that's good okay so the next item um, is um, I guess they, to look at the summary notes from the May 16, 2018 meeting. And so I guess those of you who were present back in May, hopefully you had an opportunity to review the summary notes. And um, I guess at this point, um, I will entertain any corrections. If not, then um, I'll entertain a motion to accept the summary notes. So moved. Okay, so moved and seconded, uh, and I guess all those in favor of accepting the summary notes, say aye. 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 Okay, opposed? Okay, thank you. All right, so next we will move on to um, an update. Uh, Andrea will talk about uh, the presentation that she made on behalf of GIAC to the Committee on Academic Workforce and Success. So I <clears throat> went to the uh, committee meeting last week, actually, and um, the presentation is actually very brief. It's a maximum five-minute uh, presentation of a summary of the activities um, of the um, um, graduate advisory committee. So I reported that the committee worked on elements related to um, the uh, marketable skills, that we had a discussion about those, that we discussed the um, 18 correct characteristics, which are now the just characteristics of doctoral programs. And then I gave uh, the briefest of summaries of the um, a draft strategic plan that this committee has been working on. Um, and um, there were no questions from the committee, no objections, um, and the report was happily accepted and I went on my merry way back home, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, and so if you have the opportunity, if you did not last night, um, you might look at this summary because I, it does sort of tell you kind of what we were focused on last year. Um, and then if you have interest, you can go back and look at the archive videos from that particular meeting. Um, next, as Andrea mentioned, we spent a lot of time last year providing input and working with the staff on the strategic plan. And so James and Jen are going to give us an update on that. Yeah, uh, I thought I'd, let's begin with, uh, especially for you newer folks, and also a reminder for the rest of us, how we got where we are. So um, the agency updated and, and developed a new strategic plan for higher education generally. That's the 60 by 30 text plan. And it was decided that uh, accordingly we should look at developing uh, a strategic plan specifically for graduate education in the state. Uh, the 60 by 30 text plan is has elements that address graduate education, but uh, as is not probably, I, I would imagine not surprising, a lot of it focuses on undergraduate education. Undergraduate students form by far the largest segment of higher education in Texas. Um, so GIAC seemed like the correct body to work with board staff to develop a strategic plan. Before we got started though, the agency uh, hired the RAND Corporation to do a study and basically to, uh, to lay out some, uh, some basic facts about graduate education. They went around the state and they did some focused 
uh, sort of sample inter uh, interviews with institutions and with programs. They sampled a few significant programs in the state, looked at certain disciplines. Uh, they also took a good look at some data from other states. So uh, in the RAND report, there are uh, some areas where we look at how, you know, the, the usual sorts of comparisons, you know, how does Texas stack up against the 10 most populous states, especially, you know, you see a number of charts in the RAND report where we're comparing ourselves to New York and California and Florida and the other large states with significant higher education systems. Out of that RAND report, uh, a number of recommendations and findings were developed, and uh, the idea was that the strategic plan uh, would draw upon that base that base of information, findings, and recommendations as a as a starting point for our strategic plan. Uh, so the Rand report having uh, been completed, uh, the decision was made that the best way to approach this would be first to discuss the item generally with the committee, and there were some committee of the whole discussions of the plan, what elements might const be constituted in the plan, and the first thing we started doing was developing an outline, and the GIAC committee designated a subcommittee of, uh, I think it was usually seven individuals, uh, to work with us, uh, including our current chair and uh, vice chair, a number of other committee members uh, participating. And basically that smaller group then worked with staff, primarily myself and Jen, to uh, first develop uh, an outline. Uh, to develop uh, just sort of an outline and try to figure out what are the major topics that we should address. Uh, share, we shared the outline kind of on a recursive basis with both the, the subcommittee discussed it and then we'd share it with the committee of the whole. And out of that, we developed an outline that uh, everyone seemed pretty happy with, and then we started drilling down further. Uh, the staff, Jen and myself, would or periodically organize uh, phone conferences, and the subcommittee members would call in, and we'd discuss, and we'd flesh out using, uh, using basically an online document documentation system, we'd fill out more of the plan. Uh, when we had opportunity, we would also meet after uh, GIAC meetings and we'd get a ch take that opportunity to meet face to face. Uh, once we had uh, a plan, then we shared that internally, Jen and I, we went over it with our division leadership and got some feedback from them. Uh, then we, to see, the next step was, then we took, a, took a, a good close look at the way we developed the plan and we enlisted some other board staff members. Uh, we wanted to try to uh, find more documentation and support for some of the recommendations and statements of fact that we were making. So we've done some uh, research in higher education literature, uh, again, looking at other states, looking at some published papers, and that leads us to the form that the plan is in now. Uh, it's much more now of a finished and, and uh, finished draft, not a final draft, but a finished draft. And our plan moving forward is to uh, get some feedback from the committee, to uh, get further feedback from internal uh, stakeholders here in the agency, and eventually to put it out for public comment. Uh, Jen, would you like to uh, take over from here? So um, thank you for the history of the development of the plan and um, to the subcommittee members and the staff that helped um, further develop it and bring it into the um, sort of state that it's in right now. Following the meeting today, I'll send a Word version to you all um, so that you can enter in comments where you'd like. Um, but uh, some of the so the feedback stage that we're at right now are um, if you have ideas of additional evidence or information that would strengthen the um, target strategies and goals or measures within there, um, information that is supporting um, or specific copy editing things that are in there, um, sort of the challenge of being um, working on it. Uh, very closely is that we need um, 
everyone else's perspective to catch catch those items or um, to further strengthen the um, different targets, measures, and, and goals that are included. Um, we're going to try to wrap that period up by the end of this month so that we can move it um, to the next stage of feedback and, and review and, and comment. Um, so I'll, I'll be sending that out with our summary of today's meeting is the, the Word version of this. And then you can send your comments, feedback, supporting articles or evidence or links um, back to me and all sort of facilitation that I'll, I will facilitate that communication um, with the plan. Um, it's there's a lot of information in here um, so I definitely if we want to have any questions or some brief discussion now but I think that it's something that many of you might want to sit and read and and then bring questions or comments forward and the um, on the front of that agenda item in the packet are the subcommittee members that um, helped um, in those subcommittee meetings um, and so as, as you all return to your institutions, the, they have a lot of depth on the dialogue and discussions as well. If, if you want to, um, I guess I'm volunteering, if you'd like to reach out to them as well um, to sort of see how this plan came into the state it's in today. So uh, a couple of final points. Again, the, the next steps are you to give us a little bit of feedback this, give us your feedback this month, uh, then to take it forward to the leadership of our agency. Uh, then we'll put it out for public comment. And then the final step would be a consideration by the board. Uh, I think we're aiming for the January board meeting. One other final note, especially for you newer folks, this is, this is, uh, this is all new to you, so your fresh eyes are gonna be particularly valuable to us. Uh, but I do want to kind of gently point out where we are in the process. We're quite far along. This is a completed draft. So if you have a brilliant idea for renaming and reordering all four of our priority areas, I'm sorry, we're just not, we're just not at a place to hear that right now because since we're trying to wrap things up, what we're really focusing on is trying to polish this draft and try to make it the best that it can be. So please just keep that in mind as you uh, develop your comments and feedback for us. Thank you. Maybe a couple of comments in, in that regard. Um, the plan, the committee tried very hard to have it, um, the plan not to be too narrow so that it um, would fit the variety of institutions that we have in the state with an understanding that each of these priority uh, areas might take a different shape on each of the, the campuses. But at the same time, we also didn't want to be too generic so that this would become meaningless. So we focused on four main priority areas. And then with each of them, there are a number of goals that are associated with those priority areas. And then some ways of measuring um, progress. So that's kind of the, the basic structure. But again, um, the committee kind of felt that there was enough flexibility for um, the different institutions that we, we have in the state. I have a question. Um, since I'm new, so I may maybe ask just a few. So, so the, uh, the connection of this to 6030 and the reporting back, so there's going to be a reporting between the institutions and the Higher Education Coordinating Board, a reporting mechanism? Uh, no, not for this plan. Yes, there are uh, reporting mechanisms related to 60 by 30 techs, uh, but th this plan, this plan does not feature th that level of, uh, of of reporting in detail. Really, this is this is more of a plan to provide some guidance to institutions about actions that institutions can take and the state as a whole can take to encourage graduate education to flourish, to try to try to get a vision for where we'll be in the next five or 10 years, to look at some significant priority areas that we'd like that every, that institutions and programs should be paying attention to. Because I think this is a very crisp, very focused um, plan. With our new uh, president at UTSA, we went through a strategic initiatives framework and model. And, and just looking at this, I'm, I can say, 100% of what I see in here, we already have identified strategies and key performance indicators, and it's like a miracle document. I mean, oh, it's just, yeah. it's, it's, uh, so it's a, 
compliment to, to the committee and everybody who contributed. So thank you. All right. Well, that's happy. You know, we're happy to hear that. I think the subcommittee, the idea was to have a broad representation on that group. Yeah. And so it's good to hear that perhaps we hit on, you know, the things that people are already thinking about. Uh, so. Okay, any other, can, yes, please. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> looking at the strategic plan, you said there were goals and outcome metrics for that you want to measure. Is there a timeline as well associated with it? Yes, we, we envision this plan to basically to take us through 2030, which, which coincides, roughly speaking, with the 60 by 30 text plan. I, just in looking at the contents, I'm, I'm wondering, are there um, s strategies or um, suggestions about addressing issues around diversity of number of students as well as faculty in graduate programs, teaching in graduate programs? Yeah, I think if you look at priority area number two, high quality and access to education, um, and goal one, and so that one, you know, focuses then on sort of student body and faculty. And so it recognizes the fact that, you know, you, if you want to have a diverse student body, you need to have a diverse faculty. Just for clarity purpose, I see priority area number one, we talk about the creative activity and priority area number three, innovation. How do you, distinguish between these two things like creative activity and innovation? The creative um, activity in the first part refers to the humanities and fine arts where you may not, where, where it might not be that you had peer reviewed articles. So that's that sense of creative activity. And uh, the part on efficiency and innovation is like innovative ideas for graduate education, new models of graduate education. So that's kind of the, the difference. I have a question about goal five on page 29. Talks about highly qualified undergraduate students, graduate programs. Highly qualified undergraduate students from Texas or from find the this term somewhere. So highly qualified. So I think. Um, like highly qualified, there are a few different kind of terms that it was sort of decided that that would be left up to the institution and that they would define it perhaps in the context of, you know, where they are. Um, and um, I, I believe the reason why we have this one is that, you know, while of course we want to have preeminent programs that attract people from all over the state, I mean, excuse me, all over the country and the world, we also know that it's important that we also are attracting students, you know, within the state into our programs. And um, also perhaps there is some, um, what I would say, responsibility in the undergraduate programs and, you know, helping to prepare students for graduate programs in general. So I think that's why it particularly is speaking to, um, you know, just from the, you know, I guess from the state versus, you know, recognizing the fact, of course, that we want to also be able to attract others. So I don't know if you, is there anything else you want? Yeah, I think we kind of left it ambiguous on purpose. Yeah, the idea was basically to try to um, just get more people in the pipeline, not necessarily from Texas, but just recognizing, I think there's data there that show the, the, the small number of undergraduates that go into graduate schools. So the idea is just to enhance or increase the vision of career options to make graduate education a viable career option. Yeah, so I think even in this space, there is opportunity for the creative three plus twos and four plus one kind of programs. So I think, you know, it really is just sort of saying that, you know, there is a recognition that 
um, if we're able to help uh, increase the number of our, you know, uh, residents of the state and getting graduate degrees, that that is also a major benefit to the state. So hopefully it won't be perceived as being exclusive of, you know, attracting people from outside. Karen, I'd like to direct you to page 22 for just a second. And if we look at page 22, what we see there is table three, which talks about average loan debt in Texas. And I'll grant you it's a very important issue, but one thing that we should do is include some sort of benchmarking for the U.S. inflation rate. And I just looked it up. During the period from 2005 to 2015, the U.S. inflation rate was 21.36%. As a consequence, if we look at the very first line, for instance, master's degree, that 28,190 uh, would actually be 34,211 in 2015 dollars. Or we could go with the 2015, where we see that 42,867. In 2005 dollars, that would be 34, 35, excuse me, 35,322. It all revolves around the fact that there was an inflation rate of 21%. So if we look at the master's degree and the percentage change there in real dollar terms, it was approximately 31%. That's a great point, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, yes. <laughs> We'll, we'll be in touch for your help on that table, okay? <laughs> I, I, as, the, as a faculty member at, uh, at a university with one of the smaller graduate programs, I, I want to commend the, the uh, subcommittee and staff for keeping the document, as you indicated, broad enough to be applicable to you know every kind of university from the big flagships down to the regional comprehensives with uh, with only three doctoral programs I I appreciate that um, just to follow up on that inflation correction every place we have dollars versus years, could we do those in constant dollars? Because it's really hard to tell whether there's real growth or not in some of these. The table, was it, um, on page 11, for instance, there's a lot of numbers. And it would be nice if those were in constant dollars. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Dean. Thank you. That's a, that, that's a kind of a global note for this whole report, is to normalize the, uh, the monetary figures into something, some kind of constant dollar figure. <laughs> okay, so no additional comments and, you know, of course, feel free to uh, read the document thoroughly and if you could just send some feedback before the end of the month, it would be greatly appreciated. I think we saw this so many times that, <laughs> yeah, that it's great, would be great to have some fresh eyes and perhaps if you see some, some gaps, but of course gaps of information supporting, you know, the, the strategies and the goals and things. Okay, so that said, then um, we will move on to our first discussion item. And um, so this topic, um, I think the, um, uh, I guess the staff and others would like some guidance from the GIAC on, you know, how to understand these terms, and I'm sure you probably have discussions about this on your campus, and so this is sort of multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, and, um, you know, what are, you know, definitions of these characteristics and maybe, you know, distinctions, and so maybe you could talk a little bit about how you sort of view this on your campus and even how you maybe are using those terms. So, 
to the whole jargon, we've added uh, transdisciplinary as well. So you have two disciplines, A and B. Um, the research happens in between, so you have to develop new knowledge. Uh, we call it the interdisciplinary. The multidisciplinary is uh, you have A and B, and both A and B combined works together. Uh, the transdisciplinary, we basically looked at it as um, disciplines A and B, but they need to elevate the um, level of knowledge and with more um, impact to the community, so it's a little bit broader. So after all the confusion and the fuzziness on campus, we kind of started to define it at least with our own terminology. Others want to, and I mean, feel free, of course, also to talk about maybe that terminology in the context of perhaps research and, and education initiatives or things like that that you might be doing and how you're using it. So it, here, here are some concrete examples that, uh, that I've recently seen here, a bit just based on what we've received at the coordinating board. Uh, increased interest in uh, interdisciplinary uh, engineering, for instance. Uh, we've seen we've seen a couple of proposals for that. Uh, we've seen I've seen a couple of proposals dealing with the interdisciplinary SIP itself, right? SIP 30, which is the interdisciplinary SIP, which is often used now for teacher training programs. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's nothing to do with teacher training. Sometimes it truly is a combination of two or more disciplines uh, working together in a particular direction, whatever that may be. So um, it would be helpful, part of, part of this is part of the driver of why we're asking the question, since we're not you know, on your campuses, uh, involved in the research, involved in teaching these stu programs to students, uh, it, it helps us to understand some of these terms and how you're using them. So again, to take a con concrete example, what's the difference between an interdisciplinary engineering program and a multidisciplinary engineering, because we've gotten both kinds of requests, and sometimes it seems to me that we're using those two terms almost interchangeably. Other times, like uh, our, our UTSA colleague here just said, other times it seems like institutions have a very clear and separate definition for those two terms. So uh, do, do, do you think that there is any sort of consensus in the field? That, that would be helpful for me to know right off the bat. We've been guided uh or maybe constrained by by the establishment of interdisciplinary as a teacher training discipline and so on our campus when we mean interdisciplinary but not teacher training we use multidisciplinary yeah. you know as a we're, we began as a teachers college as did many of us but that's still a big thrust for us and so once interdisciplinary was established as a teacher training uh, 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 SIP, then uh, that sort of uh, precluded its use for other purposes. But we've substituted multidisciplinary. We have a, a division called uh, the Division of Multidisciplinary Studies. So that, that sometimes is just two disciplines that, that have uh, combined or that uh, collaborate, but um, that, that's what we do. Okay. That's helpful. At, at a health-related institution, the term that's, um, that's being used and is actually quite a, a big initiative across the state is interprofessional education, where you've got the multiple professions coming together to have patient care. So we rarely use multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary. You, 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 pref you use the term interprofessional. At the University of Houston downtown, we have a um, master's program in nonprofit management that we say is interdisciplinary because we have um, courses that are in political science, business, um, technical communication, lots of different disciplines. Um, I would say, though, that it is more multidisciplinary. That is, you have multiple disciplines that contribute to the program. 
my PhD is in American Studies from the University of Minnesota, which is the first interdisciplinary program in the country. And my understanding of interdisciplinary is the understanding of the ways in which multiple disciplines come together intersectionally to produce a particular standpoint of knowledge. And so when you have multiple disciplines that are not necessarily thought of as the way in which they are building intersectionally, then it's multiple disciplinary, <laughs> but interdisciplinary is, is that intersection of the disciplines. So, uh, talking from another health sciences institute, I agree with what was said earlier. We also call it interprofessional, and uh, something very tangentially related that we are working on is global health, where we have public health folks as well as nursing and medicine folks all working together, trying to get kind of a certificate program in that so many different students from different professions get to interact and learn about each other. So it's very interesting for the students, but we are trying to put that together and struggling with it right now. Coming from a, um, what I classify as an interdisciplinary uh, field of study, when physics and biology and anatomy came together, um, kinesiology was born. Motor learning is another subfield of the hard sciences that was born um, as a, a, a means of, of solving solutions. To me, a multidisciplinary is when all these things are still separate and have their perspective on an issue from, from separate venues, but a true interdisciplinary program or um, perhaps innovation, especially at the graduate level, is when two disciplines merge to the point to where they create something brand new. And so um, when you get so good at what you do that you can see things that have never been seen before, that to me would be the true interdisciplinary approach. Visually, uh, James, that would be represented by a Venn diagram, right? You'd have three circles that are separate. That's multidisciplinary. Where they intersect is where they're interdisciplinary. That is a wonderfully simple visual. That I, that's, a great, that's a great metaphor. Thank you. I, so I, oh, go ahead, Dean. So I, I think that was a great example, but once it's successful, it's not interdisciplinary anymore. It's a discipline. Um, and because we have to submit and get approval for degree plans, I think by definition, by the time it's a degree, it's no longer interdisciplinary. In fact, it's not even multidisciplinary. It has to be a discipline. Otherwise, we can't get a degree. Um, we have a, a, a title in the UT Austin catalog but if you check the origins of that title, it goes back to the 20s and 30s when UT Austin could grant a degree in anything it wanted, a PhD. There was no coordinating board. The, the predecessor didn't exist yet. I think that was in the mid-50s, if I remember my history right. Um, and those were truly ad hoc committees that had representatives from many disciplines for a student who wished to pursue a degree in something that did not fit in any discipline. So it was truly inter. It may have had, it required support from multiple disciplines, but it was really in between disciplines. But we can't do that anymore by definition. So, I, you know, I think by the time it's successful, it is a discipline. By the time there's a degree, it is a discipline. And I guess following on that, yeah, so I, I think, you know, like we started this energy masters and we called it an interdisciplinary degree because um, 
you know, we were having, I don't know, maybe it's multidisciplinary, but we called it interdisciplinary. And so the intent was the students would actually have all these different modules. Some of them would come from various, you know, STEM, you know, fields, but then also they would include maybe policy and business. And I recall, you know, the group was struggling because when we submitted it, we called the coordinating board, it was like, okay, so we don't know what zip code to use. Um, so because, you know, there isn't exactly an energy one. And um, I think ultimately they picked a zip code, but I think we really weren't quite sure. And we discovered after about the second year of the program, we picked though a zip code. This zip code though does not carry STEM. And so then we had a bunch of students who came from STEM backgrounds, particularly international students. And you know, there are implications about, you know, um, you know being able to get right your, um, right, yeah, your training and stuff like that. And so we actually changed the number. Um, and so I think that is definitely something that, you know, I guess, you know, we could use some guidance on anyway. It's like, so how do you sort of decide then if it really is multi or interdisciplinary on, you know, you know, what zip code, what area to go to? You know, do you sort of try to think about, okay, I'm somewhere in the STEM world, so let me try to, you know, push it under? Because you know, Dean is right, in the end, you have to sort of align it to something, right, um, in order to give it a zip code. And um, so, um, and then I think the other thing I was going to mention was just the kind of also supporting what Dean was mentioning. So we also kind of call programs interdisciplinary if they cross multiple colleges, just because of that's how we're organized. And so we had material science and engineering, which included science and engineering, okay, and so it was interdisciplinary. But then eventually we decided to make that degree program a department. And so then once we made it a department, then it had to fit under one of the colleges. So now it's under engineering. Um, and so, yeah, I think we are sort of in some sense forced to kind of compartmentalize them into something because they need to align with, you know, zip codes and things like that, so. The structure's set up that way right now, but one of the, the beauties of doctoral programs is you may start with one zip code and you may actually create another um, in the end. Um, some of ours didn't exist, and, but they have emerged. And so, yes, you, you always have to align in our st current structure. You have to align with somebody, but the creativity can still be there to create something new. All right, any other feedback? Uh, have we kind of, you think? Yeah, yeah, you've, 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 given, you've given some interesting uh, definitions and you've described the concepts and uh, yeah, this has been helpful. I've, thank you, we've taken some good notes. So maybe another question though, James, so are there any implications on the coordinating board perspective about that terminology of something, you know, interdisciplinary or not? Uh, just, just I guess more as a conceptual model to help us understand the kind of proposals that we're getting these days, because it seems like there's, as opposed to say 15 years ago when I started the coordinating board, there's now an increased interest in multi and interdisciplinary programs, particularly graduate programs. Uh, so it just helps us to understand what we're getting uh, from you in terms of requests and help us understand how to review them. Well, it's probably the case because most societal issues can't be solved by just a single discipline any longer. So that you need individuals who minimally can work with individuals from other disciplines. And you also need individuals who have a broader understanding of not just their own disciplines, but but others it connects to. And that's probably why why you're seeing that. I'm, I'm not entirely surprised. Um, I've always been told though that it's more difficult to get an interdisciplinary degree through the coordinating board and that there is some caution against creating um, too extravagant <laughs> interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary programs. Is that the case or is that just some unfounded rumor? Uh I th that may have been more the case in the past when it was newer or more novel. I think now there's, 
it's becoming commonplace enough that I, I, I don't think that that would, that would be true. I, I would say it might only be a challenge if, if there wasn't a clear vision for the program, if people are, if the, if the idea wasn't yet fully formed, then we might, we might notice that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you have a good plan for it, uh, we've we've increasingly seen uh, proposals, not just interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary, although we've seen quite a few of those, but also as those merge together and become new fields, we've seen proposals for doctoral programs in fields that just didn't exist before. Uh, I'm thinking of, uh, not to name names, but a program, there was a doctorate in clinical laboratory science that, re that was recently uh, proposed and approved, and that as far as we tell, just about never existed almost anywhere in the country before. Uh, so uh, it, is, it is a challenge for us to stay abreast of how quickly things change and grow and develop. Uh, that is certainly, that, that, is, that is always the case because higher education, you know, reinvents itself periodically. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that multi or interdisciplinary programs face uh, any harder road uh, as long as they have a clear conception of themselves is what I want to describe it as. Um, in looking at the data that you provided with this about the number of proposals that are approved, is there something, a general synopsis that you can provide as to those that are not approved, what some of the issues are that are keeping them from being approved, especially at the doctoral level? I would want to go through and review before I said anything categorical, but I can tell you that the 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 thing that uh, that is probably the easiest to get tripped up on is need, workforce need, and clearly establishing workforce need. Uh, if it's and there can be some challenges to that if it is a new discipline and it's a new field and there isn't much out there to sort of establish the pathway, that, that makes it more challenging. Doesn't make it impossible at all, but it just makes it a little more challenging. The institution has to be a little more creative in the ways that they investigate and document the workforce need. Um, Dr. Silverman, do you have any uh, comments? Sure. Um, so there, you know, we've, we see all sorts of things here at the coordinating board. Some denials are, um, you know, I've seen one that Full Sail said, oh, we're going to do exactly like this other program. So that, that's what we're going to do. We don't have anything in place yet, but we're going to be just like this other program. We've, um, I, I'm not even kidding, we've had um, proposals that were completely uh, duplicate of a different proposal that we had received from another institution in previous years, and we kind of questioned whether or not the institution really did their due diligence on their own campus um, and looked at their own needs. Um, so those are a couple of things. We look very closely at cost. Uh, can you know? Do does the institution is the institution going to cover its costs with this program? Um, is there really a student demand for it? Or is this just the aspiration of a couple of faculty members who managed to get this proposal all the way to us? Because um, it's a long road to get to us. Um, so those are a few things off the top of my head. Certainly, workforce need, demand. Are these, are these graduates going to have a job? You know, let's face it, we don't need to be spending more and more on education for students. And if they walk out the door, they're not going to be able to be employed. Um, that's a disservice to that student and to the institution, quite frankly. Um, but those are kind of some off the top of my head. I don't know, James, I, I think more examples? One other might be the unnecessary duplication issue. Uh, it, it might be that you have a great idea for a program, a master's or doctoral program, but the field is already really crowded and there's a lot of really good high quality programs in the state and perhaps the proposal didn't do a good enough job of establishing what would make this program different or unique or valuable in a way that isn't already covered by some other program. And that's, that's an important part of the role that the coordinating board plays. Uh, and it's, it's something that we, that we try to bring forward into the picture because of course every institution has a good reason for proposing the programs that it wants. And it sees, you know, a market out there, it sees students that it can serve. But our, our role is to have the big picture view. And 
you at the institution, you, you may not be paying much attention sometimes to what the other institutions in the state are doing. We, we occasionally hear this uh, quite openly, you know. What about all those other programs in the state? Oh, well, that's, that's your problem to worry about, coordinating board people, uh, right? Because your job is to promote your students and your programs and your institutions, and our job is to have that statewide perspective. And you can see it in the coordinating board's legislation. If you look at Chapter 61, where it talks about the basic founding of the coordinating board, what is the coordinating board supposed to do? It's right up there in the beginning avoid unnecessary and costly duplication of programs, right? We want good programs, we want high quality programs, and we want programs that are needed, but we don't want more programs that are actually needed. That's very helpful, thank you. I have a question. Um, in thinking about the distinction between multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, does the committee um, look at the how prescriptive a uh, program is, that is, if the disciplines are and the courses in a program are kind of already specified, then you have multiple disciplines, as opposed to being a little more wide open where students can choose kind of across the university or across disciplines, period, in which case it might be more interdisciplinary. Yeah, I, th I, th yeah, I think there is a challenge there. You know, uh, because if it's too wide open, then the concept itself starts to become a little nebulous, right? Uh, greater specificity generally suggests a more clear vision for what this program is and what it could do for students. So there's, I think there's a happy medium there, right? Uh, and that's, I think, usually what we're looking for. Certainly to my mind, if I see a, a proposal for a uh, multi or interdisciplinary program, I, I do want to see that there's a clear conception of what those disciplines might be. Dr. Silverman? Uh, I'll build on what James is talking about a little bit. Um, we want to make sure that that really that the student has a home. So with that interdisciplinary, if, if no one, if, if there are too many cooks in the kitchen, nobody's going to claim that meal so or something to that effect <laughs> um, but basically we want to make sure that the student has a place to go that the institution knows where that program's located so if it is a business and an engineering is it more business or is it more engineering um, so we, we get into those kinds of issues um, and it makes it difficult for students but you know should engineering and business work together collaboratively of course, and do we want to encourage that? Yes, we do. Um, and as with the health professions, the interdisciplinary stuff is, or interprofessional, it's wonderful. And it's changing how um, health professions education is, is being conducted. So we want to encourage that, but we don't want to, we want to have the student have a home. And we want to have a place where we know to put it in our SIP code. You know, quite frankly, that's just administrative. So, so let me clarify this for my own self as a chair of a department. I have two sets of classes. One is called um, risk management, which includes finance and information systems. I think that would be classified as interdisciplinary because it's all within business. Then I have another class and area which is um, energy finance. Energy finance actually is engineering and all of that that goes on plus the financial end and bookkeeping and all of that. So I would consider that to be multidisciplinary. Is that sort of the understanding that we are going with here? Uh, I, I, I think that's certainly internally consistent and coherent. Uh, uh, I guess until we, as a higher ed community, all very clearly agree on what these different terms mean. There may continue to be some confusion, uh, but based on what discussion I've heard today, you know, um, that, that, that sounds consistent with what I've heard. Thank you. I'll just add to that one more thing. Again, the distinction between the course level and how you're categorizing that SIP at the course level um, and the distinction between the program level. So if, that, if that's helpful. So. 
Okay, so I think we sort of stepped a little into seven, so we can transition into that one. And this one is sort of talking about capacity and expansion of graduate programs. And I think it's, you know, kind of trying to get at um, kind of on your campus, uh, how do you, you know, have these conversations about capacity and expansion? And there's, I guess, three tables of data that were provided, and so we've already sort of talked a little bit about one, which is the table on approval of graduate programs. And I thought this was pretty helpful because I guess I didn't know how many were not approved, and so I think that that's good to know. Um, and then the next one, the next table is a table on the current number of graduate programs. And then lastly, one on um, graduate student enrollment. Um, Right, which is interesting because I guess it shows we've had a decrease from 1617 to 1718 in enrollment. So, okay, so um, I, I think, um, I don't know before we open it up if, you know, James, you have any kind of, any other thing you want to add to contextualize sort of the, the input and discussion? Um, this is an important issue that you'll see covered in the RAND report. It's one of the major uh, topics that they were asked to consider and provide some data and recommendations on. So especially, for, again, for you new members, I'd encourage you to go and, and read through the RAND report. It, uh, the whole thing, if you have time, but certainly the executive summary is quite valuable and not too lengthy. Uh, and that link is available on our, on our website uh, under the reports section. Uh, if you have trouble finding it, just email me or Jen and we can, uh, we can help you out with the link. Um, but this uh, this uh, this issue of capacity and expansion of graduate programs is ongoing, partially because it's it's uh, not always easy to nail down. It's again, it's not easy for you folks at any particular one institution to know at a glance uh, what the other programs in the state are doing. Particularly if there's a lot of them. You know, if you're talking uh, engineering or education programs, wow, that's a lot of territory to cover. So it's kind of hard to know what everyone is doing out there. But at the same time, that's our obligation to take that perspective into account, to know, uh, okay, you want to have another, you want to have a program in, I'll, I'll pick an area, uh, education. There's a lot of uh, doc, edu doctoral and master's education programs out there. So if you're proposing one, you should have a clear sense of what's going on in your region and in the state as a whole, and what particular segment of that market are you going to be uh, appealing to, that student market? You know, are you going to appeal to the working professionals? Are you going to appeal to students coming up through the pipeline? What's your idea? Um, some hearing your perspective about uh, how you view capacity expansion. When you're considering, for instance, you know, one of your departments comes to you and they've got an idea for uh, a new master's or doctoral program in an area where you didn't have it before, uh, how do you look at the field? How do you try to decide what, uh, what the capacity is and, and uh, are, the st are the students out there being served right now or is there room for you to serve some more students that aren't being currently served and how do you determine that? Well, first off, I think this is just an excellent, excellent discussion. At Texas A&M Kingsville, our MBA program actually has doubled in the last two years. It's just off the board. I ran out of faculty. Um, some of my faculty are teaching two overloads just to try to cover what's going on. And so we're in the midst now of trying to create programs um, within the MBA to try to service everybody that's coming to the RMBA program. And so it's, uh, we needed a new one in accounting and a new one in finance just to try to service everybody that's coming through the door. Well, it's an online program, so it's servicing them online. Thank you. In <coughs> biomedical PhD program, the capacity is relatively easy to determine by the funding that's available to support the graduate students. So we, we survey our faculty every year, we look at our research expenditures, and we look at uh, whether our students have any issues getting placement when they choose a laboratory. And so that's how we determine capacity. Dean? So putting it in the context from our other document about <coughs> both student debt 
and recruiting the best students. Um, the question we have to ask is, can you support the students? And is the support you provide them competitive? And in fact, will a student choose to go to your program as opposed to another university? So, um, you know, we're very concerned about student support. I'd say that is, it's sort of like the biomed. The determining factor is how many can you support? And we're going back and looking at all our programs with that in mind, regardless of field. Because we're, we've just finished, let's see, I think we're about to do our last program review. So we've hit, we've been doing them now for seven years. And we're now through our 100th program review, give or take. And that's one of the big questions I always get asked is, what do you, what do you, how do you support your students? How much do you pay them? Is it competitive? Cost of living in Austin has skyrocketed. skyrocketed. Housing is a nightmare. Um, it's occasionally limited by how many students faculty can deal with, but it's more likely to be related to how much money are we going to try to provide those students. That ties into student debt. If we don't provide them anything, their student debt goes up. So resources, especially financial resources, I hear both of you saying are a key, if not the key, determining factor. And I, I think the last campus climate study we did for our graduate students, I don't, I think that one of the top things on their list was financial instability. And I think there's a, there's a big correlation to failure to complete and money. So what about in the context of master's programs? So I think we're probably both are talking about doctoral programs, right? Where clearly people support the students, but what about thinking about it in the context of students that you're not supporting, which may be some standalone master's programs, professional master's? We look at, um besides just the need, establishing the need in the, the um, area and nationally, depending on um, the program, it really is, what are we gonna do differently that's not done already? And um, because a lot of our master programs are in, are in fields that are very um, well represented already. So what is it that's gonna make this program, a program that's going to attract students. Um, we don't have um, necessarily the scholarship resources and the financial resources uh, maybe that other institutions have. So what's going to be different about this? So we're not just um, putting out a program that there's other programs that can suit students' needs. So you're, you're really talking about sort of a curricular emphasis or focus that would allow you to distinguish your program from other similar programs in the same discipline? Correct. Um, we, we do the same thing, um, but we also, because we are in a system in which three of our institutions are really close together, then we have conversations with our counterparts at UH Maine or Clear Lake um, to one, to see how we, we can be different, but also um, just, uh, I, I think, kind of working in a collegial manner so that uh, we know that each of the programs are serving our students. You know, we serve a different population of students or have uh, different curricular approaches and, and emphases that, um, that will offer something different to, you know, the plethora of students in the Houston area. And I think um, for master's programs, fundability, what kind of resources are available for master's students is also an important factor um, on, on our campus anyway. And also a discussion of uh, is there workforce need and what kind of earning potentials do students have when they graduate so that if there is student, if there are student loans, if there's student debt, will they be able to get out of it and 
a reasonable time frame um, because of the, the earning potential that they have with that degree. So I think that does make a, a difference on, on our campus as well. I think this is an interesting time to also go back to our earlier conversation about interdisciplinary and how a research area that may be very attractive to students, to, new, to students, can be developed into a certificate or master's program and, and then as how, how that research area becomes an academic area, I guess, is the bigger question. So tying our, t our initial conversation about interdisciplinary um, and interdisciplinary research areas and interdisciplinary education, how does, you know, how does student interest in these research areas? I mean, I think a lot of, for example, science and uh, tech, science and engineering is done at the interface of different disciplines. And so how does that research get converted into a, um, you know, academic program? And, you know, I've seen some of these programs become very popular and sometimes from the lower level. So a interdisciplinary certificate that's very popular and then an interdisciplinary master's degree and then an interdisciplinary PhD. The other thing is that our, our master's programs are professional masters, so um, in addition to looking at workforce um, need and career opportunities in developing programs, then we have conversations with potential employers to find out what are the competencies and skill sets that they might be looking for in a particular sector and um, we're co cognizant of that as we're developing the curriculum. I guess our online programs kind of come into this conversation also, right? Because I think many of us are now also having to make decisions of whether or not a program might be face-to-face -face or online or um, perhaps both, and I think it's, you know, trying to see whether or not there is a demand, perhaps, you know, I think for the online ones, is there's a demand that maybe is, you know, can be served outside of your campus. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, for us, one, we think that some of our graduates might like to have a master's, you know, from our university, but they live in Dallas or they live, you know, some other place, you know, and so that's, I think one driver is that you feel like there is a demand perhaps outside of uh, your you know, local area and their ability to be able to come and do it face to face. Um. And Karen, related to that is how many students can you put into an online class as opposed to a face to face class? I actually can put more people into a face to face class than an online class. So that's a capacity limitation. The other one is simply if you have any accounting faculty that are looking to move, I can use them. <laughs> I am so short. Um, finance, too. Uh, there's just not the PhDs out there. If I had those, we could expand programs tomorrow. Um, some of the uh, discussions we're having on campus, which is pretty difficult, is also to talk about the, the life cycle of a program. So what is the, um, what should be the, life of a program because it's basically a portfolio issue so you can cannibalize your existing programs by throwing in a new program in there and so um, part of it is at what level you want to uh, build this undergraduate certificate master PhD type of a pipeline and actually um, just um, communicate the need to the students sometimes the students are not aware of that but then when you start building those different programs and, and they have these connections at the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary level, you get two different groups of faculty members just going against each other and, and um, that's a very difficult thing in, in an academic environment. So my background is in industrial engineering, so I look at this as a product development. But when you bring all faculty members with very specific discipline knowledge kind of around the table, they don't think outside the box. So that's a very big difficult situation. I don't know how others are communicating these kind of things. Um, especially we have a pretty broad graduate council um, that we're trying to restructure. Um, everybody, it's more of a compliance type group. Anytime you use the word, for instance, management in a part of a 
a paragraph. If you're a culture of engineering faculty, the culture of business folks may just say, oh, you know, that word belongs to us type of thing. So I don't know what your experience is when you're thinking about program development. Well, on our campus, um, new program development is very much part of the strategic planning of the of the university. So, if a program is not on the department's strategic plan, on the college's strategic plan, on the provost's strategic plan, it will not move forward. So, it's a very structured process that happens from the bottom up and also simultaneously somewhat um, uh, top down. So that. Um, uh, so that it's it's pretty clear what kind of programs we might be going with, and um, and and on our campus, then the money follows the program. So that if the provost decides to move forward with a, or the president decides to go forward with a particular program, money will be set aside for that program. So it is very clear when that program is established that it will be funded and not. Um, yes, we have this program and now see what you're going to do. So I think that's um, something that we're taking quite seriously. I've never been anywhere where the strategic plan was actually a living document um, before coming to Texas State. So it's refreshing. That's great. And that another question sorry, uh, regarding the financial support uh, that we were talking about. It differs from profession to profession, right? Like from medicine to nursing to graduate school. How is it actually determined and who actually influences those decisions? In terms of levels of financial support for students? Yeah. Um, well, I would think that the your, your own disciplines tend to kind of establish norms for what students get paid, at least by, at least on a state by state basis. I mean, there's variation within the institutions. Um, I can say that, you know, from a coordinating board perspective, student support is a really important issue. And uh, that's one of the areas where if, if, say, we get a proposal and we're reviewing your proposal and we notice that the level of student support proposed for this program is out of line with what other uh, well-regarded programs in the state tend to, to offer, uh, we'll go, usually go back to the institution and ask, why, why is your student support so low? Why isn't it in line with what the, your, your peer institutions are doing? So that, that's something that we do drill down into quite a bit. Uh, you know, it speaks to the uh, student debt goal of 60 by 30 techs, but it also speaks, I think, pretty clearly to the quality of the program, right? That people, people react to money uh, in academia just like they do everywhere else, it still attracts them and uh, you can have a hard time getting the best students uh, if, uh, if your, uh, your compensation package is, is not in line. And also the setting of the institution also really matters for the type of students that we're getting right you know, When you're starting as a new school and you're coming from a, you know, without a no name kind of stuff like in a border city or something, it, that also influences the kind of uh, students that we get yeah. and what kind of support that they need to get. Yeah, my observation is that, you know, a, a, a new program, especially in uh, a big discipline, you know, a discipline meaning that has a lot of visibility, public visibility, which there are a number of other prominent programs in the state, uh, the new programs will often be quite generous as a way of attracting students. I can think of a couple of professional programs that have been recently approved here at the coordinating board and a big donor covered, you know, tuition for the entire first cohort of students as a way of drawing them in. Thank you, Karen. So, so James, I know you've alluded to the RAND report a couple times and so in the context of this question, um, I know Andrea had talked and others have talked about new programs and I know that the, in the RAND report there's a lot of really good information and you've heard me say this also, there's also some omissions, serious omissions and some erroneous conclusions and some of those omissions and erroneous conclusions have to do with where to put graduate students in the future of the state of Texas. For example, you know, when law schools across the country are, are closing and reducing the number of seats, and one of the conclusions is law is gonna be one of the fast growing areas in, in Texas, I worry, okay, about the, 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 the validity uh, and the veracity of that analysis. 
The other thing is that um, the RAND report misses, of course, the fact that there may be jobs created as a result of research and great education that don't yet exist, and the contribution that, that has to the workforce is unknown quantity. But I know when we review new programs, you've often told us that you, you look at workforce projections and so on, and a lot of the litmus test has to do with what the contribution is to Texas. Well, the simple fact of the matter is it may be that we need to look at a, a broader um, uh, workforce than just the state of Texas. Well, certainly the goal is to increase the economy of the state. We probably will be a net exporter of students for some time, right? Um, and it's no accident that California and New York have the largest economies in the country. The f I think California is the fourth largest economy in the world. And that is because what? They have some of the best and well-developed university systems and the largest graduate enterprises. So as we think about this, what contributes to, uh, or what are the factors contributing to capacity expansion, we need to think about the broader context of what that means to the economy, not just of Texas, but to the nation. Yeah, absolutely, that point is well taken. Uh, that's one of the reasons we look at both national and state and regional workforce needs, especially when we're looking at doctoral programs, because we recognize that doctoral programs play on a national stage, not just a regional or state stage. So, you know, following up on the mark, you know, kind of pulling out some things in the RAM report, I think I recall that there was maybe a recommendation. I don't know if it rose to the level of sort of being the, on the final recommendation list, but I know for sure it's in the section about perhaps something related to market research and, you know, maybe the coordinating board or the state or something like that sort of helping, providing some resources for programs in relation to that? Uh, so what, what we've done recently is uh, the agency uh, purchased a subscription, I guess you'd call it, to, uh, to Burning Glass, right? Wasn't that the one? Which one? MC, that's right. Okay, there are two competing products, and MC is the one that we decided to go with. Uh, I think we have three or four use licenses for here in the agency. Yeah, Jen is one, so I'll, I'll let her talk. She probably knows more about this than I do. About using it? Oh, well, okay. that we're basically looking at how useful it is. We've been we've been sort of piloting it in in our own efforts, and yeah. So um, with graduate program proposals, um, we've been using it to. We, you can get down into zip code information um, for employment, salaries, and then zoom out to sort of broad trends as well. And the um, MC as a um, as a product or a service itself has continued to evolve some of the features on it. Um, so we're exploring some of those this fall as well for how that helps with understanding not only sort of a a one-to-one -one connection of uh, discipline and industry, but then also um, as I was hearing discussed already this morning, sort of creative connections or anticipating where these um, students or the research could be um, going in the future and, and connectivity across industries. So um, we've been using it um, to sort of contextualize and get a better understanding, especially um, I, I'm not a subject matter expert in all of the different disciplines I get to look at, but that sort of helps um, frame and, and contextualize. So we'll continue to use that and sort of see how, how helpful that is for understanding um, the field and anticipating the future. And I hope once we've built up a base of experience that then we can make some sort of um, recommendation to you about the usefulness of such tools and whether your systems or institutions should consider uh, purchasing them. That They're certainly not cheap. <laughs> These 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 tools uh, uh, have 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 a cost to them, uh, so that's one of the reasons we only have a few licenses here in the agency. So it's something you'd want to carefully consider because it certainly is an investment. Uh, Dr. Silverman or Peoples, do either of you have a comment about these? There's a. I yeah, I just wanted to point out that we also depend on the institutions when you submit proposals for new graduate programs, or really for any program for that matter. But we also depend on, on, on you to help us with this whole issue of demand, either for now or in the future, because you may have access to uh, information and data from professional organizations or associations. 
and that kind of thing it helps shed some light on this and so any anything you you can else beyond the sort of uh, sort of normal if you will workforce data that we get from uh, TWC and, and BLS and but also from MC uh, that you could provide is always real helpful to us in in looking at that so just keep that in mind as well I think during my, my time here at the coordinating board over the past 15 years we've seen the assessment of workforce need and capacity uh, to just become more and more complex. Uh, for instance, now, you know, institutions might no, not just have a program. So let's say that we're looking at a program, someone wants to have a new doctoral program in, say, educational leadership. Well, in the past, we would just go around and say, okay, well, who's got other educational leadership programs? Where are they located around the state? What's their enrollment? How many people do they graduate each year? And these kind of simple factual examinations. But now we have to look at these same institutions may have a face-to-face -face version and an online version, and each of those has different capacities and perhaps has a different student base. You know, one is local and regional and the other one's state or nationwide. Uh, we have, an incre and because of that increasing online presence, then there's also competition from outside the state, coming into the state, offering similar programs. So our, our challenge to, to correctly assess not just how much need is out there, but how much existing capacity out there has gotten increasingly complex. And, and it has led to the, a question I've heard voiced in different fora, including in board meetings, which is, how many is enough? How many are too many? That, that, and that's, that's an honest question. It's not easy to assess anymore. When, when you know, ba compared to back in the days when every program was at a brick and mortar institution and you knew exactly what the capacity was and it was all determined by how much classroom space and how many faculty you had and how much student support you had and these other pretty simple one-to-one -one sort of relationships. Well, sort of combining those two thoughts, Rex's and James is there, you know, does MC actually forecast needs? Do they give you ideas of what the demand will be 10 years from now then? There, there are some linkages with um, BLS pro projections um, and employment projections as well in there. So there's crosswalking that can happen um, with SOC codes, CIP codes, and industry characteristics as well as um, it does projections, um, so it does historical and some projection with um, job postings and characteristics within them. So you could do some keywords if you're looking at something that was inter or multidisciplinary and you looked at some of the terminology that's put in there to see um, a broad range of fields. Um, like one of, the, one of the things to think about is that you could have um, an accounting degree, but you're working in food service because you're working at HEB headquarters. And so you would come up as a food service employee, but not, <laughs> right? And so you need to sort of think holistically about the different variables you're entering into that but it's it's got a lot of great features um, and visualizations as well so um, yeah Dean um, I was looking back at our draft and numbers we have in there you know globally we came up with 31 percent graduate enrollment increase from 07 08 to 16 17. 57% of the number of master's degrees awarded. And then later on, we've got the table showing average loan debt. And in another table, we have some vague measure of institutional support. I think that that one is.